Hey everybody, we're here today to chat with our good buddy Jeff Schroeder from the Smashing Pumpkins. When I have to take a solo and there's two people, you know, James uses from, you know, the Jerry Cantrell amps, and, you know, and Billy's got, you know, the car, it's a lot of gain. So yep. if you don't have enough gain to a solo over it, you just feel like undermanned. Yeah. I mean? So but you got it, yeah. So they're running like very distinct sounds then, right? Like, cause Billy's got, you know, four amps in his rig and has like the Karsten and the Orange and Eleni yeah. and the, it's Elo, he said? Ebo, Ebo. Ebo. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he, and uh, James is using like just Cantrell's? Yeah. Nice. The J, yeah, the J So that is like very, very different sound. So like, how did you approach figuring out how you would sit in a mix with that? Like, and approach, you know, the types of voicings that you're looking for? Um, I, I mean, I just know that, honestly, if you're just using different amp brands, they all sound, they all just sit slightly different, that that's usually good enough to kind of differentiate. And then just the way I play versus the way they play, I yeah. think that's in the way that I kind of shape shape my sound, I think that kind of helps. And honestly, the style of guitars too. Yep. You know, um, like, you know, these guitars, these Yamahas are great because they're kind of actually in between, like, really super strat sound. Yeah, like a less ball, so I kind of slot more in there. You know, nice. I don't need all the look. You know, James, the sound is a little more sludgy. I don't need that. You know, and so um, I'm kind of looking more for mid-range excitement. But you know, I, you know, to me, like when I heard, I, honestly, that distortion sound, I just fell in love with that. Whatever, have yeah. that that break up that sound. It's just like it's it's kind of addicting. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I'm the same. I mean, yeah. anybody that watches our channel and knows anything about like my story with Rev. So I met Dan because I own a screen printing company and he needed somebody to screen print the chassis for oh, the Oh, crazy. Amp. Yeah, yeah. And I was a guitar player and I was like, well, you know, I can do the printing. I'm like, I'd love to check out the amp. Yeah. And the first time I got to play the prototype of the 120, it was kind of the same thing that I sat down and played it and I was like, immediately like okay i want to know you know where did you build this like how did yeah. you do this he's like he's like what do you mean and i'm like well i primarily back then played rectifiers and i was like this doesn't sound like a rectifier but it has a modern high gain voice which is what i'm looking for from the rectifier but it's tight but still has enough sagging compression to it that it feels good like it yeah. you know what i mean and it kind of fixes some of the problems that i didn't like about other amps that i had tried and and yeah, and I, I found myself, like I bought one from them right away and then, you know, over the course of a little, maybe a couple of weeks, we talked about partnering up. And as soon as I got the amp, it was the first time that I could say that I felt inspired to play or write from a piece of gear that I was playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I, that's what I found, like, just really, you know, kind of addicting about it. And, you know, yeah, kind of they set me off. especially, yeah, as you become a working musician, you fi have to find tools that you can use quickly and are reliable and yeah. you know and i think for me like on the like i said it was a very personal thing at first you yeah. know heard that sound even like a facsimile of it through right. Felix, and going like i gotta try the real thing and when you love about what to me is what is beautiful just about like kind of the, the full-blown tube amp ex experiences and even modeling is great you know pedals are great but there's just no way you're going to get that complexity and refinement of distortion, you yeah. know, that can compete with, you know, a, you know, a nice multi-stage gain stage tube amp. Yeah. That is, there's just a, a beautiful thing about it, and it's, you know, it's, it's really kind of responsive and dynamic and all those things. But there's a, I kind of it's weird, like it's kind of weird, like a, like a, a certain formation of like the way that you can kind of almost see the way the distortion blooms yep and and i really love that and and i knew it was like a obviously a very high quality thing and and you know to play guitar on this stage you have three guitar players yep. playing high gain if it's not clear and articulate it's not gonna work yeah you know what i mean it's just gonna get get buried in and these amps have performed like so well you know really it takes a little bit because there's you know, these amps, I feel like, compared to other brands, it's got a little more, it's got a lot of flexibility in terms of, there's a lot of buttons. Yes. You know what I mean? There's a lot of variables, but not too much, because there's other amps that have even more. 
So I feel like it, like once you kind of wrap your head around it, it's actually quite simple. Yes. You know, but uh, you know, it's a little, a tiny bit of a learning curve. But I gotta say, like having that bit of flexibility really comes in handy in a situation like that. Those like different aggression modes, those different drive modes in channel two, yep. you know, really make a sonic difference and really allows me to use one head with a bunch of different guitars and that's in different types of pickups yep. and and that and that. So I I say I've you know been super happy in that in that. One of the things that I was really impressed with with the way that Dan designed those knobs and switches, because we've gotten that from tons of people that like, oh, there's too many knobs, there's too many switches <laughs> or buttons, which I totally understand when people don't want a bunch of extra features. But to me, everything is very intuitive. And also, most things are actually fairly subtle. Like the aggression uh, mode, like it adds that saturation, a bit more gain, yeah. a bit, you know, a bit of a shift in the EQ. But it's not a massive shift in the EQ, and it's not like you go from a little bit of a gain, a little bit of gain to overpowering. It it feels like things step up naturally the way that yeah. you want them to. And it, they and don't change like the overall decibel volume level of that channel on the output stage, which is great. Yeah. You know, so if you go, because I don't have, I can't go and literally change the settings. Yeah. So if I go to blue aggression to red aggression to no aggression, that channel's got to be relatively the same volume. Yeah. Uh, you know, because. You know, I, it because I, I can't go to adjust that. Yeah. You know, during the show, so that's very excellent design in that respect. Yeah, I was I was very impressed by that, and I know like Sean's kind of theory that he's had whenever he, like when he designed the tilt pedal, like he's always looking for like what's gonna be like my more setting, like what's gonna just give me exactly what I have <laughs> but more. And he's like, I don't want a lot more. I want enough that when I take a lead, it just sits night. Just slightly above, yeah. above, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and that's what's great. You know, for me, channel four, I have it a little bit louder. Yep. And I have the gain. You know, I still got a lot of gain on tap, and to me, yep. that's a good feeling because you never want to feel like you're you're maxed out. Yeah. And you're like, oh no, like I gotta, you know, get a hotter pickup or use another another pedal out there. <laughs> yep. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So. Awesome. So that's the funny thing is because. You know, I started posting pictures of my rig, and you know, and I do have some pedals in the tray, and um, I don't use them that much. You know, to be right. honest, or I don't use, actually the the two on the right. I don't use at all. I do use the revival drive. Nice, nice line, yeah, though. I do use the revival drive. Oh yeah. Actually, yeah. just in preamp mode, and so I actually it's almost like having another two channels. Yes. Because I use it for like. Really, more the old school plexi sound. Yeah. Like barely, you know, that barely overdriven. Yeah. Even a little bit less than ACDC kind of sound. Um, yep. Because I have these th these channels, which I could definitely get out of this, especially yep. channel two. But I kind of, I don't use that sound that much. So right. This works, but people were like, "What? With, with those amps, with all that gain, why do you need extra pedals?" And the truth is, I actually don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that's that's often a misconception that I see, like in the especially in the metal community, that they've kind of adopted, and in a lot of the like, especially the worship community and like clean guitar players, you see that like they're all about stacking drives, right? Yeah. But for some reason, it's been, you know, not widely accepted to stack drives in front of in front of uh, like overdriven amps already unless you're a metal dude looking to tighten it up yeah and i yeah. see that's kind of just like that's changing a lot too where yeah. guys are realizing like oh you know the the kind of tone shaping that you can do by you know stacking a bunch of overdrives in front of an already hot rodded channel it, it can give you just really unique characteristics and sounds in your you yeah, just can't get yeah, out of the amp yeah. and then you don't is, want to mess with the amp yeah which is why i like something like the analog mambino boost which is an old school 60s style line driver yeah you know and it adds a completely different characteristic to to the to the, like to the distortion sound nice know, and you know and that and that works in front of any lots of different types of distortion games. yeah yeah i have to check that out yeah and it's I, cool because it's a little bit especially for this band it gives it the impression of that old school because fuzz kind of sound because people always ask what kind of fuzz pedals do you guys use live? We don't use any fuzz pedals live because right. it doesn't translate in this type of space. You know? Yeah. It just, you can't, it's not articulate enough. On record, you can dial it in with the right amp settings and the right microphones. Yeah. It can sound really great, but live, it's always been high gain amps. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. But sometimes for leads and stuff, you kind of want a little bit of that fuzz kind of sound. So I find using like a, like a Germanian line driver kind of gives me that. Awesome. Yeah. And then you're using the Helix mostly for effects? Only right effects. Now? Only effects. No, no amp modeling at all. Yeah. Just strictly effects and signal routing. It's it's interesting that you said that that's you know and, and it does all the MIDI command channel switching and right. heads and all that yeah and all and all that and all those um, all the momentary switches all the, yeah, and, yeah. yeah well I actually you know so this this head is so smart and so similar to realize it. at first I was like oh my gosh this is complicated with CC changes but you don't even yep. need to do that like once you teach it you know MIDI you know preset one is yep. clean with nothing MIDI you know preset two is yeah because in here depending on what preset I make, I can, then I just go through the different MIDI changes. Right. And it remembers, because the head remembers all those things. So yeah. it's actually really simple. Yeah. Yeah. To get up. So I have like, basically I made, I think about 38 different combinations of buttons. Okay. Uh, great great channels and buttons. And I just have a list that's like, down in you know, preset minutes, five is channel two with red, so red drive load. Nice. You know, yeah. So then when I go to make a preset for a song, I just go, okay, I want, Snapshot one to be, preset, you know, MIDI preset five, you know, snapshot two. It's like, you know, this stuff is so sophisticated now, but so simple. Yeah. Um, it gives you just like an incredible amount of flexibility. And um, yeah, so Helix does all that kind of stuff too. Yep. Well, it's interesting, like when, you know, when we first got here and I was asking you, like, you know, how did you first become aware of Rev? I thought it was because of Sean, because you guys have known each other for oh, forever. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, when you said it was because of the Helix, I remember, so Line 6 actually bought a 120 from us on yeah. our website. And I saw that the the email was like purchasing at line6.com. <laughs> and I was like, well, I know what this is for. So I emailed them and I'm like, hey, I'm like, are you planning to model the generator for the Helix? And they're like, yeah, we are. I'm like, cool. I'm like, could we license you to use our branding in it? And they're like, no one has ever called us and asked us. They're like, you know, we won't pay you. I'm like, I don't care at all. I'm like, I want it to say rev generator or to say generator, I want it to be called the general or something else. I'm like, I want people to know what that voice is when they play it. And like Bill Kelleher from Mastodon reached out to me uh, yeah. through like fluff from Riffs and Beard or Riff, yeah. Riffs Gear and Beard's uh, YouTube channel and was like, Hey, I've been playing this red channel preset on the Helix, the Helix yeah. and you know, can I uh, can I work something out to get a generator 120? We're going, you want in the studio, and I want to mess with one. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. The first time I got that call, I was like, I wonder how many people like their first introduction to us was from the Helix because when we first did it, some other brands told us we were nuts to to license I, them. And I'm I like, I think it's oh. honestly a great idea because. So, there's so many people that are never going to have the chance to go into a music store and play this head. Oh yes, at all. And and at least, you know, when you go and you play through something like it, you get it. It's an approximation. Yep. You know, it's not exactly the same. Yep. And I've never sat there and tried to actually. Can I make this sound exactly like this? Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe I could, I, I doubt it. You know what I mean? Because it's it's because the architecture is slightly different. Yeah. You know, but. But it may, it was it's good enough to where I was like, wow, I want to go. I got to get the real thing. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, so I think it's genius, and it, it's really not a. I mean, I mean, first there's a generation of players that they have like, digital equipment. Yeah. And they're totally comfortable with the digital world, and and there are applications time where that's all I I can show up. I got to show up somewhere, and I all I do is bring something like Helix. Yeah. I mean, but I don't, you know, for me, I'm still going to play a two band, yeah. you know, and um, it's like, there's, there's really no com comparison. I mean, just because like, like the circuitry in this is so different than that. And this is made only to do that. And yeah. It's uh, to me, it's a yeah. feel thing. And modelers are really, really great, yeah. uh, especially like, you know, the Axe Effects and the Kemper and the Helix, yeah. the Quad Vortex, like they all feel really really good compared to what modeling used to feel like sure, but yeah. there's still something about the dynamics the you know the way that tube amps will like compress and sustain that to me just feels different and to whoever who i'm playing for like like i play out anymore but if i was <laughs> uh they're not going to notice the difference 
right? At front of house, they're not going to notice a difference, but I'm going to notice a difference and it comes down to whether or not I'm going to play better. And that's, that's actually the number one reason that I still prefer to play tube amps over ever using digital equipment is yeah. purely for myself. Like, yeah, I mean, and you know, my setup is very much a hybrid of using all forms yeah. of tech, using modeling technology, tube amp technology, impulse IR responses, technology, yeah. you know, but then back to a tube DI and, and a cabinet, a mic cabinet too. Yeah. You know, actually, we don't use any of that sound in the monitor or out front. Everything is through the, this, the cabinet. Yeah. This I found really interesting when you when you uh, <laughs> commented about this because I've never seen anybody else do this. And uh, I do give yeah. credit to Trace. So you know, he he brought it, and then he was like, "Let's try, let's try running through this at the end." And it yeah, you just immediately you're like, "Oh, there's that." That, that kind of feel thing because you know yeah. I mean you're going through analog to digital you know and just to make it analog one more time yeah it it, it does make a difference yeah it kind of just rounds the sound out and you know for your ear it kind of takes you know digital is is great because it carries all this information sometimes more information than our guitar playing ear wants yeah like you know we don't necessarily like want to hear all those super high highs you know, but yep. it's like but you get that information you know, even though we try to dial it out and stuff but this yep. is you know it really rounds the sound up makes it feel like like what you would more like you're playing in front of the cabin yeah i i definitely have to check that out for yeah. like when we do stuff on any of our <laughs> live stream yeah, yeah. i know yeah. exactly what you're talking about and i mean thank you question. trace yeah <laughs> yeah yeah because even at home i use i have a um, a Rupert D 1525, the Shelford, okay. you know, Mike, Mike Pre, when I, you know, and I have a, the one, a 120 head there. Yep. And it, it, I mean, it's incredible. It's like, you're like, you play it without it, and you're like, oh, it sounds really good. Then you put the, that Shelford Mike Pre, and you're like, oh my gosh, you get this whole 3D, you know, recording and getting your signal from what's coming out of the speaker to, a, a, you know, a recording device or front of house. That's a whole argument of itself. Yeah. Yeah, and that's so this is nothing that it's nothing to make up for what the amp is lacking it's just yep. like how do you translate what this does so it sounds more like what it really does coming out of the cabinet you know out front yeah yeah awesome well jeff thanks so much for taking time to hang with us and show of us your today and I, yeah. yeah so hopefully actually this might work for yeah i think yeah i think we're good